Um, I'm actually, um, just to clarify, I am the manager of community-based research and engagement for the Frack Tracker Alliance, which is a civil society organization. Um, and I, I also happen to be a visiting research professor with Drexel University, but I like to clarify that relationship uh, because my primary duties are uh, to work for an environmental nonprofit. Uh, we do uh, research and analysis and mapping and a lot of data work for uh, communities that live uh, in and amongst um, severe impacts from oil and gas extraction across the country. And today, um, I'm going to be presenting on how data transparency projects uh, emerge from these spaces as people try and make sense of complex environmental threats. Um, I'm going to expose some of the relationships of power uh, that exist between institutions and concerned citizens and operators, uh, drilling companies and other companies that uh, build things like pipelines. And that's uh, the specifics of my case today. I'm going to be talking about two case studies, two separate pipelines, and how relationships of power have changed uh, or been shaped uh, uniquely based on data availability in each of those case studies. So just a quick primer. Over the past decade, uh, drilling companies have been uh, seeking out sources of uh, oil and gas in shale fields across the country. Um, in Pennsylvania, um, this has taken shape in uh, about 10,000 uh, new shale gas wells since 2007. Um, in addition to a vast network of wells, uh, communities also need to deal with the ubiquitous network of pipelines and compressor stations, processing facilities, uh, and other infrastructure. And, uh, you know, just to give you a sense of what we're talking about here, <coughs> um, presently there's about 4,600 miles of pipelines that are proposed for the state of Pennsylvania, which is what I'll be talking about specifically today. And the State Department of Environmental Protection in Pennsylvania estimates that this number could increase to as many as 30,000 miles over the next 20 years. Um, now, many um, who oppose energy extraction um, look at pipelines as the infrastructure that's going to lock the region into extraction for the long-term future. Uh, and so, therefore, pipeline opposition has moved to the forefront of the anti-extraction movement, for particularly that project, and uh, that purpose, rather. Now, a persistent problem that exists in communities that are trying to make sense of um, pipeline projects is a general lack of information, and this critical information can include uh, things such as construction details, uh, the intended routes, potential properties that could be impacted, as well as environmental and uh, neighborhood impacts of those that are at risk. Now, in all of these instances, access to uh, understandable and affordable data could assist communities in making sense of their entanglements with pipeline projects. <coughs> Um, but because of persistent knowledge gaps, um, citizens have come to uh, significantly distrust the operators that want to build these projects. They've come to distrust regulatory agencies that are perceived as being uncommitted to transparency or in some cases working on behalf of the companies as opposed to on behalf of public interests. So these ambiguities have led to an emergence of concerned citizen groups working in partnership with technical service providers uh, on data transparency projects in order to do their own impact assessment studies or to critique impact assessment studies that are being submitted to regulatory agencies for a review. Um, and this is what the science and technology studies literature refers to as civic science. And civic science is something that's typically funded by nonprofits associated with social movements um, and focuses on undone science or areas of research that's typically ignored uh, by uh, professional scientists or government institutions. And Kim and Mike Fortune, anthropologists in STS, have argued that civic science is a science that uh, questions the state of things rather than a science that serves the state. And I just want to also note that data transparency projects can be quite performative in nature uh, and that they enact the transparent state through public expressions of having a right to data, as Ibsen and Rupert have noted in their recent book, Being Digital Citizens. So in the remainder of my presentation today, I'm going to ask um, and explore these data transparency projects in a couple of questions. The first is, from what circumstances do they emerge? The second is what uh, critical knowledge gaps do they seek to fill? And three, in what ways can they rearrange dynamics of power in environmental decision making? And I explore these in two particular case studies. The first is a pipeline project that's presently under construction called Mariner East 2. <coughs> this is a pipeline that will transport uh, ethane, which is a byproduct of natural gas uh, used to make plastics um, across the state of Pennsylvania. <coughs> and the second pipeline is one that is uh, not presently under construction, but is uh, proposed and will connect to a massive petrochemical plant that's proposed for the region. So the first case study, Mariner East 2, this is a $2.5 billion, 350 mile long pipeline uh, that will carry more than 700,000 barrels of ethane a day across the state from the shale gas fields in western Pennsylvania and Ohio 
um, and West Virginia to export terminals south of Philadelphia, and these will eventually take ethane out to Europe for plastics manufacturing. Uh, ME2 has sparked a range of responses from concerned citizen groups, not the least of which safety. Uh, ME2 follows uh, an older route for a pipeline called ME, that's now called ME1, uh, that was also uh, built by Sunoco back in the 1930s, and uh, a lot of uh, heavy development has occurred in the areas where this pipeline went. It's now you have dense neighborhoods, hospitals, schools, all these kinds of things that are in the right of way. Um, now, um, <clears throat> some particular incidents have really brought attention in the state to the risks of pipelines. Um, one in particular last year exploded um, due to uh, poor welding joints um, and completely demolished a house about 200 feet away. Another house about 600 feet away was melted. Um, and the, the person who was trapped inside that house received third degree burns. That's the house that was destroyed along with all the trees 200 feet away. So this has, and you can see this is the route of the pipeline through some uh, apartment neighborhoods, uh, neighborhoods that have been built um, since that original right of way was established in 1930. So I want to start with a quick timeline of Mariner East 2 uh, and how it evolved. Um, the State Department of Environmental Protection first received permit applications from Sunoco in May of 2014. These permits were sent back uh, several times due to technical deficiencies, which is not unusual in such a process. And with each round of those revisions, the DEP received updated GIS shape files from Sunoco that illustrated the road, potential wetland crossings, uh, pumping stations, uh, other kinds of facilities associated with the project. Uh, now, in uh, 2016, the summer of 2016, the DEP opened this project up for public comment two years after they first received permits, and much to the uh, dismay of, of people who wanted to see the, the details of this project. Now, what's interesting is that it wasn't until August 17, 2016, less than a week uh, before the public comment period ended, that the public finally received GIS shapefiles to be able to really scrutinize this project from a data layer as opposed to just looking at it from uh, written uh, or, or printed permits that people would go down to a regional office and review such as this, and they would have to piecemeal all this together. And unfortunately, ME2 received final regulatory approval in February of 2017, rather, with very few changes reflecting public concern. Now, I suggest that uh, one of the primary reasons why advocacy groups were unable to um, shape the nature of this project is because they lacked this GIS data and the information asymmetries that were involved were pretty severe. Um, so, uh, you know, like I said, you can go down and you can review these permits at different regional offices, you could scan them, you could print them, but um, public capacity to be able to actually interpret and understand these thousands of pages of documents um, was really uh, not, uh, you know, the capacity didn't exist. And uh, they did bring in technical service providers, capacity builders, legal teams to be able to help them with this process. But by the time we fully understood the project, it was too late and it had already been approved and public comment period had ended. Now, the way that the GIS data from ME2 finally became public is really interesting. Um, essentially what happened is that a director of an environmental advocacy group in Pennsylvania had an informal conversation with a high-ranking official in a different agency than the DEP and said, you know, this data should be public. And so that official leaked it to this organization and it spread throughout the advocacy community and we started doing different analysis with it and it really embarrassed the DEP. And so they ended up having to set up an official portal page to be able to then put the data out with all the permits. Um, and now they've done this for two other pipeline projects that are in the area, but it's interesting to note that of these different pipelines that are getting listed on this portal, Mariner East 2 is still the only one in which we have GIS data for because of this sort of unfortunate event um, on their, in their eyes anyway, that this GIS data was leaked. Now, the unfortunate thing is that we were actually able to learn quite a lot from uh, this data once we were able to get it uh, in hand. Um, and, you know, as we know, GIS affords some pretty uh, robust and impactful visualizations of data that can be communicated to a large public. Um, for instance, in one set of analysis, um, my organization and some community groups uh, partnered with an industrial engineer to calculate the potential impact radius of an explosion on this pipeline, which was about 1,200 feet. We then used this to discover there were about 1,000, I'm sorry, 100,000 residents that were within this blast zone in Pennsylvania. We also found four environmental justice communities that were designated by the state that were within this impact radius. And we also learned that there were um, uh, about 40 schools, public and private schools, that were within this blast radius, one of which was only seven feet away from the right-of-way of the pipeline. Um, and this generated a lot of concern within the state 
Um, you know, there was a, an incident in New York State, uh, in upstate New York, in which a pipeline leaked, and the schools that were in the vicinity were told to hunt, basically bunker in place because they couldn't evacuate the students in time, and thankfully it didn't turn into an accident. Um, but, you know, the press picked up our analysis. This is an article that was from the Philadelphia Inquirer in which they, you know, took our data and generated their own maps and generated a lot of interest. Uh, in this community here, uh, which is in Middletown, which I'll mention in just a moment. Now, uh, we also scrutinized um, the water impacts that were going to result um, of the pipeline. Uh, Pennsylvania has over 86,000 miles of streams and rivers, which is second to only Alaska. Uh, many of these are high quality, exceptional value streams that support trout and other protected species. Um, you know, what we discovered is that, well, first of all, um, when operators want to build a pipeline, they have to assess whether or not there's alternative ways of crossing the stream that would be less impactful. Or they can just choose to pay the environmental impact statement and not do those crossings if the agency allows them to. We discovered that there were over 1,200 streams, 34 ponds, and 78 wetlands that this pipeline were crossed. And these are numbers that we didn't have available unless you actually went through and reviewed all these permits. And more than 44% of those had viable alternatives that they chose not to execute. They chose to just pay the environmental impact statement, which was about $1.8 million, which was a fraction of the $2.5 billion that the project was going to incur. So these numbers, again, were really impactful. And concerned citizen groups ended up using this in things like GoFundMe campaigns to be able to hire watershed specialists. In this case, they raised over $5,000 in that same community of Middletown. They've since done another GoFundMe campaign which has raised over $20,000 to try and fight the zoning rules in their town that allowed the project to happen. So despite these interesting findings, the reality is that you know, the project was still approved. And so the critical questions are, what might have been possible had we had access to this data sooner? You know, would we have less impact to watersheds, less populations at risk? Would the project have not been executed at all? Um, for Mariner East too, we may never know. The second case study I want to talk about is a petrochemical plant that's going to have an extensive network of pipelines that are going to bring commodities from these shale gas fields um, into its facility to be able to um, process this into plastics. Uh, it's also, eth also ethane. This pipeline project is still in its infancy. At present, the operator is still signing up uh, landowners uh, so that they can sign easements to allow the pipeline to go across its property. But there's much to worry about. Um, you know, permits have already been approved for the facility, um, despite legal challenges on the part of the advocacy community. And so the advocacy groups are looking for alternative ways to be able to push back against this project. Now, incredibly, we already have GIS data on this project, and it also came into existence through really strange uh, ways. Um, a company that's contracted for the project accidentally left their GIS service public for the better part of a year. Um, through just really basic Google searches, we stumbled on this massive archive of GIS data. Um, it's not downloadable, but through really painstaking processes, we were able to you know, do screen captures, text recognition, manually tracing on new layers, all these creative ways. And we consulted with um, uh, digital law attorneys at Harvard and at UPenn to make sure that all of this was legal, and it was. Um, and uh, you know, it's been really interesting to see what this has been able to do for us. For one, one of the things that I do as manager of community based research is I do sort of difficult data workshops to prioritize questions of data. Um, and some of the things that we can manage on this is that one, uh, advocacy groups wanted to use this information to start canvassing landowners and knocking door to door, make sure that they were aware of the project, see if they could sign them on to agreements that they wouldn't allow the pipeline to happen. And so we did things like this where we produced walk sheets based on the information that we knew of the properties that were going to be impacted and which ones that had already signed agreements, and they were able to produce tables of qualitative information that we could feed back into it and understand the nature of the project. We also know all of the watersheds that are potentially going to be impacted, specifically all the way down to the survey data and whether or not they think there's going to be alternative crossings or not. We also know what populations are potentially going to be impacted. Um, and in this case here, what you're seeing is um, something called the, the um, Class, uh, class boundaries that pipeline, uh, the U.S. Pipeline and Hazardous Material Safety Administration requires pipelines to produce to uh, understand population densities and they have to use uh, thicker pipelines when they go through dense areas. None of this would have been available, well, none of this is still available with Mariner East 2, but yet we have it all on hand presently. Now, what I started to realize here is that while we were doing all this work, what essentially we were doing is building the groundwork for an alternate critical impact assessment. Um, one that's a counter narrative to uh, what's expressed by operators and those that are expressed within the official environmental impact assessments of permit applications. Um, and, you know, um, so far we've kept a pretty low profile that we have this data. In fact, to my knowledge, the company doesn't even know yet that we have access to the data. And so please be discreet. 
Um, this may change though, because we're starting to discover that they're being a lot more vocal about their narrative. And so uh, next week I meet with this group again of advocacy groups to decide if we're gonna take a more uh, sort of aggressive approach and, and, and this performative approach of actually seeing if we can counter that narrative with the data. So to summarize, um, the things, the points I want to make here is that one, data transparency efforts emerge um, when people feel as though they've been denied access to tools for making sense of complex environmental threats. Two, it's a mode of civic science. It's a science that questions the state of things rather than one that simply serves the state. Three, there is such a thing as too much data too late. The, the, you know, the DEP may claim that it sort of uh, satisfied demands for data with Marineries too, but we weren't able to do anything with it because of the timeline <coughs> of those events. Uh, four, early access to data builds capacity to articulate alternative critical in, uh, impact statements that may account for many externalities that are not shown with environmental impact statements that are submitted by companies. And then ultimately, I just want to make the point that the engagements that are seen around this new proposed pipeline, petro, you know, the petrochemical pipeline, may shed light on how early access to data could drastically alter the dynamics of power between uh, citizens, industry, and regulators in pipeline debates, and hopefully um, it will you know, fortify this precedent that data should be available to the public in order for them to be able to weigh in prior to public comment period so that we can understand the nature of the projects. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sebastian Mout. I'm coming from south of France, and I'm uh, working on a PhD uh, for two years now uh, in sociology <laughs> about the notions of digital descent and on the subcultural and alternative dimensions of, of the internet. And I'm going to talk today about uh, the actual advance of my research, uh, and particularly one point related to the power of data as a tool in favor of mass surveillance. So uh, I think that nowadays uh, data have become paramount issues in many different research fields. And one very interesting sociological approach is to question, thanks to the key concepts of activism, information, and above all, awareness, the consequences of big data on digital activism movements and um, organizations' daily struggles, especially those specialized in information sharing and popular education. And generally uh, speaking, the questions are, are they socially, are they culturally impacted by such growing phenomena as big data? And how do they manage their information processes? How do they get in touch with the mainstream people, non-activist internet users, and try and raise people's interests in such issues? <coughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you partial results of an ongoing empirical research on the field. Uh, dealing with this issue from a particular angle, which is the influence of Mr. Snowden on, um, on the corpus of French digital activist organizations acting within the subcultural fields of cyber alternatives and, and popular education. So the, the famous whistleblower revealed four years ago what many people suspected within these spheres. But um, uh, he triggered a global indignation uh, that resulted in hundreds of local initiatives all around the world and although the, the French uh, organizations I'm focusing on actually uh, suspected uh, the exploitation of big data, they could hardly share their, con their concern with people outside of their spheres. And so, uh, as Snowden's uh, whistleblowing pointed at the actual power of big data, they could finally rely on facts uh, actually covered by mass media. So the point of this presentation is then to, to enlighten the following hypothesis and to show to what extent the very notion of awareness uh, relying on Mr. Snowden's uh, mass covered warnings have, has actually redefined activism's communication strategies among, uh, among mainstream internet users. And to do so, have been putting into practice a definite methodology and a research corpus on the field questioning the transmission of awareness and its reception. Because uh, soon after the, the beginning of my research, I realized that France happens to be very active in the field of digital activism uh, in favor of internet privacy web democracy, free softwares, and against, of course, state surveillance, the exploitation of personal data, and so on and so on. And an actual network of complementary organizations has, has been put in, in place for about 15 years now. Uh, here are a few examples the, of these organizations. They try and give those global issues some national or even local sustain. And my research goal is to meet individuals acting within the name acting in the name, sorry, of these organizations and, and have chats and conversations or even interviews with them. 
So uh, this is the, the, the first part of my method. And the second one is a, is a survey I'm diffusing among uh, non-activist internet users to question the reception of their, this transmission process. So to begin with, I'm going to talk about the awareness <coughs> transmission process. So I think that this is paramount to understand uh, what is at stake when we talk about awareness. Because even though the only presence of big data in our Western digital lives is actually a fact, uh, do we know what they are and, and what they are used and exploited for? And being able to answer such questions is, I think, quite difficult. And even within the digital activist spheres I'm, I'm focusing on, awareness shouldn't be considered obvious and undeniable. Uh, indeed, I quickly realized that the proper distinction has to be done between, uh, on the one hand, awareness, and on the other hand, suspicion. Because suspecting the exploitation of personal data as a mass surveillance tool uh, couldn't be considered as actual awareness until someone showed up with some clear evidence in hand. And that's precisely what Mr. Snowden did. And one, uh, one of the activists I, I encountered on the field with the, the sweet nickname Puyu <laughs> uh, from the French organization Pharmasoft told me his feelings when he realized that his old suspicions suddenly became awareness. Uh, thanks to mass media coverage. He told me something like, it was clearly horrible. All my paranoid thoughts becoming reality, it was like, you know, I didn't want to be right. I wasn't happy to be right. End of quote. So here the effectiveness of awareness uh, among the mainstream rests precisely on being right, on actual evidence and not only suspicion, and on one's ability to make big data a real <coughs> issue, thanks to a constructed reasoning and a definite <coughs> communication strategy. So such an ability, the unthinkable, unless those whose commitment is to raise awareness among the mainstream, uh, non-activist internet users are definitely aware of big data's machinery themselves. And then Snowden's impact can be noticed first on digital activists th themselves, on what they are, even before what they do among the mainstream. And for example, an activist told me that she was personally, I quote, influenced by people like Edward Snowden, not only by what he said or what he is, but also by what he represents. And thanks to Snowden's revelations, that we can see as some kind of an archetype of what <coughs> Mrs. Uh, Gabriela Coleman calls an act of healthy democratic dissent, uh, activists can claim awareness themselves and increase the legitimacy and the, and, and the probability to have their message taken for granted. And uh, I'm going to quote the point of view of a very interesting and very experienced activist uh, called Lionel, Lionel sorry, from the French uh, organization called April. He told me something like, we knew it would happen someday. And then Snowden leaks the whole stuff. He leaks hundreds of documents, and, and now no one can say that's not true anymore. This is an interesting argument, end of quote. So Mr. Snowden has literally become a core argument within the, the French digital activism network as, act, as an actual embodiment of digital awareness. He provides their discourse about the importance of digital control a newborn legitimacy that goes along the huge mass media coverage of the whole story. And all the activists I encountered on the field actually stressed this aspect of their, uh, of their own daily commitment. And uh, one of them called Tom from a south of French organization called, called Combustible gave me his point of view concerning re users' relationship with their machines. He told me, I quote, the Snowden files actually helped the free software course. People realized that the softwares they have always been using didn't belong to them, that, 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 that they have been the property of business companies making them available and that they had no control of them, end of quote. Nevertheless, I must insist on the fact that Snowden couldn't share such an information to the whole world by himself. And apart from his current reputation, uh, he is not, of course, the only informer. He, he rather symbolizes an intermediary between organizations dedicated to the spread of information, mass media, and, and the mainstream spheres. And mostly, Snowden has been giving tools and content to those whose job or commitment, or even both, is precisely to deal with information and share it within the public sphere. So we have some kind of a communication process that I could sum up, uh, sum up this way. And a good, a good example of the institutionalized informers I'm referring to are Greg Greenwald and Erwin McCaskill, the two journalists from The Guardian, who really uh, got committed in favor of the Snowden's files and made it as accessible as possible to everyone. But whereas we heard a lot about these guys, we, know, we don't know much about those digital activists acting in the shade of mass media. And I'm going to focus on two examples 
making the transmission strategy from a non-institutionalized perspective quite clear. The first one is a paper published in 2014 in the direct aftermath of the Snowden's revelation and published by Lionel, uh, I, uh, I already talked about him, in the French national newspaper called Libération. So this article, among many, many others, shows how the, the organization manages to make Snowden the core argument of a discourse meant to have readers immediately react. I, I won't have time to go into precise details, but I'm going to, show, to give you just a, a short <coughs> quotation showing the general tone of the paper. Uh, a rough translation would be, Snowden's, fine, uh, Snowden's main lesson is that time has come for us all to be in control of our digital lives. The ball is in our courts, we can ignore the warnings he sent us putting his life in danger, but we can also mature our own digital uses and give up our state of passive consumers, end of quote. So here Snowden is referred to as an argument meant to stress the importance of digital control, and he contextualizes the organization's discourse and makes it, I think, much more legitimate. And the second uh, element I'm going to focus on is a very interesting uh, awareness campaign that has been put in place in 2014 again by the French organization Framasoft, just a few months after the Snowden's revelation. It struggles against internet business monopoly and the omnipresence of what they call GAFAM, uh, J for Google, A for Amazon, F for Facebook, A for Apple, and of course M for Microsoft. And this campaign is called Degouglison Internet, in French or in English something like let's get rid of Google. So this cartoonist style taken from the very famous uh, comics uh, Asterix and Obelix all right, characterizes one of the most daring and audacious alternative initiatives in France these last years because the organization made the incredible bet that it would replace within only three years the main 34 services of the internet with alternative free softwares in favor of, I quote, a free, decentralized, ethical, and united internet, end of quote. And in October 2016, uh, just a few months ago, they, they published the actual advance of the whole thing on, on their blog. So as you can see, the campaign is quite a success. Uh, the organization has acquired within only two years a certain recognition within the French digital uh, uh, internet-speaking spheres. And it even goes beyond what this small organization, resting mostly on volunteers, actually expected. So uh, I don't have uh, very much time left, so I'm going to, to, to talk about uh, quite uh, quickly uh, about the reception, the process of reception of awareness. Uh, if we look at the growing success of the campaign, we can say that awareness transmission in France is in good shape. But when we say that using alternative tools represents a completed and definite form of sudden awareness, uh, a few activists I talked with actually measured their own enthusiasm. One of them from Framasoft, Puyu from Framasoft, uh, put forward the very notion of process to try and moderate the whole thing. He told me, I quote, among the mainstream it took time. It didn't happen all of a sudden right after the Snowden's revelations. People didn't panic like, oh my God. Help us, what are we going to do? It was more a matter of progressive awareness, that's what I think, end of quote. So I'm going to put into perspective this interesting individual feeling and cross it with the online survey I'm currently working on. So uh, I have a few questions in this survey dedicated to the question of awareness. And the very first uh, question is, have you ever heard of these people? So uh, it's based on a sample of 118 uh, French people from diverse social backgrounds and from 18 to 85 years old. So as you can see here, uh, uh, even though Mr. Snowden remains by far the most well-known digital activist, only 50% declare he's, uh, he's, uh, they, they know him. And the second question is, are you aware of what these people struggle for? And here we can notice that there are different levels of awareness. <coughs> we can see that the number of people who declare they actually know what these people struggle for is much smaller than those who declare they know Mr. Snowden. It signifies that some people heard about him without necessarily knowing why, knowing what he does or what he represents. And surprisingly, the next and last graphics enlightens a paradox. I wrote a question that allows people to draw parallels between internet notions and four possible answers. For example, according to you, where democracy is one, a myth, two, an ideal, three, a reality, or four, I don't know. So they have only one possible answer and thus have to make a choice between these answers and uh, roughly between optimism and pessimism. And as I don't have much time left, I'm going to focus only on the two notions rooted in Mr. Snowden's message, which are privacy and state surveillance. 
you can see that the two only stats that reach or even go beyond the average are related to these notions. 71% see privacy first and foremost uh, most as a myth and 50% see state surveillance as a reality. So here, these figures are, I think, paradoxical compared to the two previous graphics because the general awareness concerning the sake of online privacy is much higher than the one related to the existence of Mr. Snowden and what he does. And if we add to this figure the 11% who see privacy as, a, as an ideal, it reveals that 82% of the people I could, I could give the survey actually think privacy is to, be put in, is to be put into question. So in the end, these graphics show that even though 50% declare they don't necessarily know Mr. Snowden, the, con and the content of his message seems to raise concerns in much higher proportions and is not necessarily related to him as a symbol of these questions. But as a conclusion, I would like to ask you, can this figure 71% rep uh, be representative of the advance of uh, digital awareness and can awareness be measurable? I think uh, very often very interesting debates spring from such a question because I, I think uh, as far as comprehensive sociology is concerned, I would say that these graphics are very sensitive elements that cannot be exploited as proper data, but rather as a starting point for, fur for further analysis. These figures for me represent a starting point and allow me to focus on people's relationship with their machine and relationship with their own awareness from both activist and non-activist point of views. And the questions are, do they manage to put, it to, to put into question their own awareness? How do they use it as far as they claim it? And in the end, does it change their online habits? So, um, uh, it leads uh, to the question of one's self-representation on the internet. This is in my last uh, sentences. Uh, I'm going to conclude on, on, Mr. on uh, Dominique Cardon, who is a, a French famous and incredible sociologist. Mr. Ca Mr. Cardon makes a clear distinction between what people declare they do on the internet and what they actually do. And I really think that this distinction can be applied to the question of awareness. If we focus on people's actual uses of the web, looking, for example, at the huge, huge number of Facebook active accounts nowadays, we can <coughs> say that even if users know the sake of their personal privacy, most of them keep going as usual without changing their online habits. And so far, this study has been showing me that, showing me that awareness from a, an activist perspective is the first step in the global subcultural and activist process of transmission dedicated to the decentralization of the internet. Thank you very much. Okay, good morning everyone. My name is Venetia Baba and I'm coming from the Cyprus University of Technology and um, I'm coming from the Department of Communication and Internet Studies and um, the last years I'm working extensively within the field of uh, social movements. Today's, uh, in today's presentation, I will focus in uh, data activists and uh, specifically in data activist practices and tactics and, and in relation with the making of Web2 agency. I had a video, but I think I will pass it because I will be out of time. So uh, which are the main questions that I would like to explore uh, in this presentation and uh, um, the questions that I'm actually working. First, uh, I would like to determine that activist uh, two spaces of struggle mm -hmm. and discourses. In the second level, I'm interested in identifying to what extent these data activist taxi tactics of resistance enable users to interrogate specific dimensions of big data, going from uh, uh, determining the problem, the solution, the consequences, and uh, determining the awareness effect uh, in the level of the user. And last but uh, uh, not least, exploring to what extent these <coughs> data activist tools empower user through uh, their affordances. So uh, for doing so, I'm, I'm using the, the definition of uh, Stefania Milan uh, regarding data activism, and I'm considering that uh, data activism uh, is, uh, is including social and political practices and tactics that they are uh, there uh, in the intersection of social and technological dimension of subjects. Action, 
And um, most of all, uh, that activism gives the notion of the active civic uh, participation and engagement where through that activist tactics and practices, users can become aware and empowered. The theoretical framework of this study is still ongoing. It's some pr preliminary uh, theories that we are still working on it. But uh, as a point of departure, uh, we're using the notion of affordances. This notion has been, this concept has been used extensively to account uh, for the possibilities technologies can afford to the people, to the user who use them. And it goes from specifically the, the field of uh, social psychology. But uh, in, this, uh, in this conceptual framework, we are reconsidering the concept of affordances uh, through uh, the proposition of Nagy and Neves, who uh, are uh, adding a critical twist, let's say, and through the uh, concept of uh, uh, imagine uh, affordances, we can evoke the imagination, actually, of both users and designers' expectations for technology that are not fully realized in conscious ration rational knowledge. The conceptualization of imagine uh, affordances uh, allow us to challenge the assumption uh, of affordances that are immutable uh, and identical for all users, demonstrating that at their core, they are about interpretation. Um, we are linking the notion of affordances between the theory of Stuart Hall encoding and the uh, decoding model approaching technology and artifacts as texts and reading position as uses. The oppositional uses are unexpected, unintended, or wrong uses of the technology. I will give some examples later on, in the sense that users devise actually affordances and designers, uh, that designers had not initially thought of these uses. And <coughs> this might be a sense of hidden affordances. So two main questions uh, for this uh, research, which are uh, the data activist discourses rega regarding platform power and user agency, and how data activist tools attempt to empower users through oppositional affordances. The methodology, uh, we map the main data activist tools within the social web. You can imagine that we found ourselves in front of a lot of uh, uh, tools and application. And we de we've decided to focus on the corporate, uh, the data the, activist tools that they have a link with the corporate social media platforms, explicit reference to social media platforms, or explicitly challenge uh, the use and functionalities of social media platforms. For the data analysis, <coughs> mainly qualitative analysis on text found on data activist tools. And second, the, an interface analysis based on data applications and corporate social media. Those are the ones that we uh, choose to focus on. Um, pop your bubble, apply magic sauce. You can have a look if you're interested in this field. Going now more in depth to the empirical analysis, first of all, uh, we've tried to determine in which level data activist tools can uh, challenge the economic structure of power as the problem per se. And we saw that most, uh, most of the data activist tools are uh, uh, trying uh, explicitly to interrogate the meaning, the problem, the power of the, uh, the economic structure of power. For example, uh, we found that uh, data selfie uh, determined that Facebook reactions let you express how you feel about a link, photo, or status. While such data might be helpful for your uh, friends, these recorded feelings also enabled increased surveillance, government profiling, more targeted advertising, and emotional manipulation. We are observing a pow that power has shifted from the new media as a revolutionary power based on principles of distribution and contribution, commodification, ex exploitation to new media capitalists. For example, we can see that emotional profiles could affect one economic future. Amazon could use your reactions to feed dynamic pricing. Banks might see sad or angry customers as a higher credit risk for a loan. Or a future employer could treat a sad profile as a sign to negotiate a lower salary or to skip that candidate altogether. This is an extract from Data Selfie as well. A second problem uh, um, 
is the problem that are mentioning related to the archiving, the storing, and moten, mo monitoring users' action by determining insights about the users' habits and desires and then selling the data for profit. Through your computer, mobile phone, and other digital devices, you leave behind hundreds of digital traces called data traces every day. When your digital traces are put together to create stories about you or profiles of you, these become your digital shadows. This can give others huge insight into your life and they, are, they can also be totally wrong. Either way, once they are out, they are out there, they are almost impossible to control. They are mentioning that the activists, uh, they are mentioning that the user is, most, the user is mostly unconscious but also mentioning that the user is locked in in walled in walled gardens, unconscious about the ongoing situation within the data fight society. Why does Facebook need your phone number or your phone contacts? Why does Facebook track the time you spend? The user, while unconscious of the situation, new media capitalists gain more social and economical power through monetary wealth. Will Second, they are mentioning the consequences in user level, two consequences in the level of the sociality of the user and the filter bubble. Corporate social media platforms became spaces per excellence for building and maintaining sociality where user is now in control. And this is the gravity of the mediated wrong of Facebook through the cultural practices it, um, it imposes, liking, friend, friending, sharing for sociality. This uh, can let us think uh, that uh, it's a way to a standardization of expansion, which operates according to the logic of decentralization by controlling social relations and creating social bubble. For example, the data, uh, the, the tool, um, uh, data activist uh, application, Popular Bubble, says that only 5% of us see social media posts that differ greatly from our world view. So actually, we have an impact here in, uh, in the level of relations uh, through uh, that they are trying, there are some other extras, but I didn't have the, uh, the space to put them. They are making or excluding new relations, pushing sustain, sustaining sameness or similarity as a foundation from fr friendship, and controlling <coughs> a rather safe conception of similarity. Uh, Facebook and uh, corporate social media uh, platforms, they uh, uh, advise, let's say, user to a sort of menu, a menu driven social identity which can contribute to polarization through uh, the sense of pseudo socialization and pseudo interaction. Now, turning now to the uh, making of user, user agency. We, um, we are, uh, um, we acknowledge the fact that there is a multiplicity of user uh, within uh, within the web too. Here, our results concern the common user and also the developer activist, the activist that can uh, uh, construct his applications and tools by using uh, tools uh, tools and settings from the social media uh, application. So first, in the first level, awareness building through end users, legal policies, knowledge, or the functionalities of corporate social media platforms. It means that most of the data activist tools and applications are pointing out the, the necessity for the user to know about how social media platforms are using their data. Lost in a small print, this is uh, digital traces. What did you actually agree to? And they are proposing to, you, to the user to investigate and to give them some tips and tools how to react with it. Th this makes us uh, thinking about the notion of sovereign interactive user proposed by Gell in his book in 2014, where he's explaining how user can feel empowered, self-producing, and, and autonomous and free subject because the, he has this ability to move between uh, the social media platforms and to create his own content. But at the same, this uh, sovereign interactive consumer, even if he has the legal knowledge and the legal policies to be aware, if he is aware of the situation, can by per performing this role, the subject get into an individual power building where actually thinking that is an interactive consumer increase in pleasure, convenience, and power as <coughs> global corporate corporation alter their advertisement and product offerings to meet the consumer's desire. <coughs> 
also uh, resistance uh, the DA tools propose uh, for the common user to resist on the profit making logic of corporate social media by engaging in alternative tools and applications like for example the Kune. When you use a tool your data lands up with the company who owns the, the tool, the only way to really keep your data out of corporate hands is to use alternative free and open source tools instead. Resisting also the proposed uh, data activist, they propose to resist to the common user to resist through correct corrective power actions. This means to reverse the situation by active participation and, and engagement. Instead of allowing the social media platforms to sell their data, the, some, uh, for example, the uh, application Commodify Us propose to the user to, can, uh, to uh, so if them can make money from your data, why <laughs> not you, uh, you don't, so uh, why not you? So to enter a market, enable users to enter a market for their data. Okay, I pass the collective agency and I'm going to the level of uh, the, the affordance. How we can empower user, uh, DA, uh, data activist tools <coughs> propose to empower users through oppositional affordances. First, we can create meta affordances. How these data activist tools reveal hidden affordances of the corporate social media platforms by enabling a visualization of user data metrics and action in separate data activist interface. Like for instance, data, uh, data selfie can allow to record clicks on likes in newsfeed, the duration to spend, so they can create these meta affordances. You can actually play with your own identity and mix up uh, the algorithm in the corporate social media platforms. Okay, let's pass. Uh, they can create anti-affordances, they can, data activist tools can remove or hidden the affordances of corporate social media platforms from user. So uh, this uh, data activist tools advances an alternative form of connectivity which is operating the black end and which facilitates participation mostly the business models of corporate social media platforms. And this is, a, for example, an example of uh, anti-affordances is uh, the endemic criticator uh, and that activist tools which uh, hides all the metrics of social media platforms or corporate social media platforms. I will, uh, it was very fast, but I will conclude uh, with some final, <laughs> some, uh, final remarks. Uh, of course, we'll, this is an ongoing research, uh, but we have to be critical about whether the adoption of activists, of data activist practices and discourses really le leads to effective voice or only to more opportunities to raise voice. And uh, this is associated and strongly of uh, what matters he really here is how people's practices of voices are sustained and the outcomes of these practices are validated. So more research is needed uh, from the side of the end user and this is uh, my research I think is very uh, complementary with uh, the one we uh, Sebastian proposed earlier. It's very important to go more in depth in the awareness process and effectiveness of these data activist tools and, and applications. Thank you very much. So my name is Britt Paris, and I'll introduce myself as I'm pulling this up here. So I'm a PhD student at the University, University of California in Los Angeles, um, and I'm doing sort of a reflection, or I'm going to be talking about a little snapshot of reflection uh, by myself and my colleague Morgan Curry uh, on data activism efforts that we've been a part of and that we've been studying. And so, um, right, so this is as much of a snapshot. There's a lot more that I don't talk about that we've been doing that we can maybe talk about in the Q&A. So, um, on January 20th, 2017, some of you might recognize that day as the inauguration day of Donald Trump. Um, so on that day, a group of students, researchers, and librarians gathered at the University of California, Los Angeles to protest the incoming U.S. administration. But instead of marching and chanting, participants were there to learn how to harvest, seed, 
scrape and ultimately archive websites and data sets uh, related to climate change that would be then mirrored and distributed on servers around the world. Um, so the need for such work, as we were actually doing the work that day, quickly became palpable. Within hours of Trump's inauguration ceremony, official statements on anthropogenic climate change vanished from governmental websites, including whitehouse.gov and the Environmental Protection Agency. So the UCLA event was one of several data rescue events uh, that have cropped up around the U.S., supervised by the Environmental Data Governance Initiative, which is an international network focused on threats to federal environmental and energy policy and the University of Pennsylvania's program for the environmental humanities. So these workshops, these data rescue workshops, I just realized something here, I should, oops, never mind. Um, so these data rescue workshops focus on the very existential dangers that the Trump in administration seems to present. Not only, the, uh, not only these threats to the modest climate protection goals set by the global community in the last 40 years, but also to the mainstream science that investigates anthropogenic climate change, environmental justice, and a host of other related issues. So Michelle Murphy, Patrick Kilty, and Matt Price at the University of Toronto, who launched the first data rescue event in December, so preceding ours, call this kind of activism guerrilla archiving. So in this uh, talk, I'm going to explain how radical or how we can understand guerrilla archiving or this notion of guerrilla archiving uh, with relationship to radical archival practices and in tandem with data activism by analyzing Data Rescue's current work on deleted data. And to do this, I'm first going to look at uh, data activism and critical data studies <coughs> interest in questioning the power of official statistics with relation to social justice uh, issues. So critical geographers, Craig Dalton and Jim Thatcher, draw upon STS notions of civic science and call acts of resistance to politically dominant data sets counter data action. And this notion draws from their work in critical GIS, uh, which is an approach that probably all of you know, an approach that diverges uh, from the conventional view of geographic maps as a model of the world to one that views maps as political and legal claims uh, or interpretations of reality. Um, based on this framework, purveyors of public participatory GIS engage in counter mapping, which is a method of emancipatory action, generally by a community, such as, for example, indigenous peoples looking to reclaim or to denounce external dominance of their resources. So counter data practitioners must be aware of their own perspectives and privileges, as well as the possible outcomes of their work. The authors pose that counter data action can offer possibilities for political liberation or aesthetic expression that actively confronts or redresses power asymmetries found in technologies of surveillance or capitalist accumulation uh, data broadly. Another theoretical understanding of the work can be found through Michel de Certeau's concept of tactics, uh, this idea of weapons deployed by those traditionally lacking in power or without the financial or social capacity to form long-term strategies. So just as counter-mapping sought to repurpose tools of state-making to express the perspectives of the indigenous in the previous example, so too can counter-data actions create spaces of community knowledge-making and repurpose technologies to counter mainstream science and industry. So be it termed counter-data action, data activism, stat activism is another concept in which uh, stat activists collect and deploy their own data. Uh, this form of knowledge production, or these forms of knowledge production, have also been critiqued as a tool of power and rationalization by the bureaucratic state. Critics of statistics uh, have wholly dismissed data practices of, as oppressive tools of accounting that perpetuate classism, racism, sexism, and, at that, and that are, at the very least, uh, subject to serious issues of control creep. Uh, scholars um, such as Candace Lanius, for example, have called data and their related algorithms inherently fascistic uh, because they masquerade as a neutral alternative to human decision making, this sort of black box that settles human affairs through automation. Yet to criticize on principle the rationalizing logic of accounting and statistical assessment would, as Isabel Bruno says, allow a monopoly of these instruments of data and algorithms to the powerful. And furthermore, as the proponents of critical data studies argue, uh, this statistical work can form the basis for more than positive assessments of phenomena, giving way to humanistic and aesthetic expression, 
um, you know, interdisciplinary encounters, and even humor. So guerrilla archiving, getting back to the concept of guerrilla archiving, this is a term that's not found in archival literature at all, but examples abound. Uh, the term guerrilla itself comes from the Spanish word for war and implies Im irregular, impromptu tactics in a struggle against powerful forces, often on one's own home terrain. Building archives has been, it's already been an integral part of social activism throughout, you know, throughout time. This work challenges dominant narratives of the past and helps us rethink how we preserve memories for the next generation. For these archival activists, archival work is not a neutral act, but a form of political destruction. For example, in Nazi Germany, um, Franciscan monk H.L. von Breda risked death to smuggle documents from the estate of Edmund Husserl, which many of you know uh, as the father of phenomenological, uh, father of the tra ph phenomenological tradition. Uh, and uh, also a Jewish philosopher. Uh, he smuggled these documents on a train from Freiburg to Berlin. These documents were held in a safe in the Belgian embassy before traveling to the University of Louvain. And they remain at the university archives today, ensuring that you know, future access has been uh, enabled to these important philosophical works. So in the shadows of uh, Nazi-occupied Europe and in many other circumstances, many archiving uh, operations took the form of bold political work. They reacted to a regime that wanted to rid scholarly Jewish voices from the historical and cultural record. And another more recent example, uh, the Maser Lesbian Archive was accumulated in a residence in the Altadena neighborhood of Los Angeles in the mid-1980s. Uh, dedicated volunteers collected <coughs> photographs, pamphlets, written correspondence, film projects, plays, poetry, and everyday ephemera from discarded envelopes to cocktail napkins. Uh, this archive serves as a testament to the vibrancy and viability of the decades largely invisible lesbian culture. As Alicia Selly at uh, the CUNY Graduate Center and her colleagues argued in a 2015 paper, community archives like the Maser offer, and I quote, local autonomous spaces for alternative historical narratives and cultural identities to be created and preserved. These collections often spring up independently of government or scholarly institutions. The creators, feeling politically marginalized, seek to create their own collective identity on their own terms. So autonomy, as we see, is key to the success of these archives, which are often maintained, owned, and used by the very people who generate them. By remaining independent from formal institutions, these activists are making a statement about how entrenched organizations play a role in the archives' political necessity in the first place. So past and present marginalization, slavery, violence uh, to particular communities remain central to institutions of American democracy, whether through universities, federally funded historical archives, or uh, through other means. And for this reason, we can't always count on such institutions to meaningly, meaningfully memorialize on behalf of those um, voices. So autonomy from central institutions can also protect valuable materials within politically volatile environments. And in a more recent uh, and dramatic example, preservationists and janitors used metal trunks to smuggle, smuggle historic Islamic documents out of the Timbuktu's archives into individual homes, basements, and closets, and away from advancing ISIS soldiers. Uh, and again, we see that in times of political violence, it becomes necessary to surreptitiously pr protect items of cultural legacy. And these decentralized efforts are vital, not only to save the materials themselves, but uh, they serve uh, some cultural sort of recognition or cultural relationship uh, to those in individuals involved in saving these, uh, these items, these materials. The Timbuktu example shows how guerrilla archiving becomes at once a necessarily collective and a distributive act. So today's data rescue efforts, uh, sort of shifting it back uh, to data rescue, these efforts may be high tech, but they have much in common with the Mazers collections and with the Timbuktu smugglers. The work relies on volunteers, and the archives exist on a multitude of servers, not attached to one, any one central institution. However, this work, um, this sort of radical archival work is usually thought of as disturbing hierarchies of power. In some ways, data rescues aim to do the opposite. 
They reinforce traditional structures of power, protecting data created by government-funded scientists that documents evidence of climate change. Rather than create an alternative narrative of history, these data rescues actually aim to replicate and distribute that data. But the political work or sort of the political antagonism lies in decentralizing this information, um, protecting it, but not reinterpreting it. So these data rescues strive not to challenge a critical scientific narrative, but to protect it from a post-truth mentality that makes climate change denial seem a viable social act, one in which facts pertain only to individual perspectives. So this may be different in some ways from some guerrilla archives of the past, but it's still a way that resists power. Uh, this type of power that casts empiricism and our future, project, or future progress on climate change aside. Whoops. Um, so web mirroring, seeding, scraping, um, and archiving generally have joined the litany of other guerrilla archiving tactics alongside midnight smuggling operations, marginalized oral history making, and uh, basement zine collections. Data rescue events continue to emerge across the U.S., working to outpace any further disappearances of federal climate change information. Guerrilla archiving puts the onus on the data rescue community itself to preserve this scientific work, and in the process, these events foster a collective collective concern for one another and for the future. There exist clear affinities between radical archival practices and data activism as they focus on including interested stakeholders and uh, allowing them to gain the informational literacy they need to assert their points of view. While it's clear that data activism or counter data action can be meaningfully applied to issues of deleted data, the type of deleted data that Data Rescue deals with, we argue that a blend of these modes of data activism can be effectively combined with radical archival practices to generate advocacy and attention to deleted data that carries import for political and social justice issues. So considering data rescue efforts as a mode of radical archival activism encourages a definition of deliberative data practices, drawing from theoreticians of the public sphere and Calon and Lassum's hybrid forms which uh, seek to widen participation participation uh, in adjudicating le legitimacy and to provide spaces for such actions. Uh, data Refuge attempts to augment and complement authoritative data on a phenomenon as opposed to um, more generally agonistic data practices which provide alternative representations of an issue. Instead, Data Refuge can be seen as a meld of data activism and radical archival practice that adheres to deliberative data practices as it openly resists a form of power that casts empiricism and our future well-being aside for cynical greed and short-term gain. So one of the speakers at our UCLA event, Joan Donovan, who's a researcher at the UCLA Institute for Society and Genetics, maintains that this type of archival work, this radical archival uh, environmental data justice work should be seen as a small glimmer of hope and as a tactic that we can all engage in. She says, and I quote, the question of what we can do in this political climate hostile to climate change has, again, a relatively modest answer. And she says the answer is small interventions with grand intention. And that's it.